Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce next speaker, Rostislav Kajan. Will tell us about limits of uh, recurrence coefficients. Again, uh, recurrence is like was in the previous talk, which connect nearest neighbors in a table in a latest multiple orthogonal polynomials. And he, in a, for limits of this, uh, of this uh, uh, recurrence coefficients, uh, he will tell about differential equations. Please, Rostislav. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me well? Yes, yes, we hear you very well here in Moscow or in Sochi. Sorry. Um, uh, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizer for inviting me for a talk and uh, thank you for giving us opportunity to do this uh, online. Uh, it is a pity that we can't be um, all present <clears throat> um, and I hope we can all meet soon. So uh, today's talk is about, um, as, as uh, Alexander Ivanov said, differential equations for the limit of the uh, of the recursion coefficients for the multiple orthogonal polynomials. <clears throat> uh, this is joint work with Alexander Ivanovich. Um, so this is uh, the plan for the talk. I will discuss briefly uh, some basics of orthogonal polynomial on the real line. Um, I will shorten it to OPRL. Uh, then I will also mention some basics of the multiple case. So the, the shorthand for that will be uh, this. Uh, and then I will talk about the results, some brief idea of the proof and show you some pictures. Um, so, okay, so we start with the uh, basics of uh, orthogonal polynomials on the real line. So uh, the starting point is a probability measure mu on the real line. I'm assuming compact and infinite support. Um, then we form the corresponding orthonormal polynomials. And it's well known that they satisfy, well, this is a definition, and it's, it's well known they satisfy the three-term recurrence relation. So these ANs and BNs are the uh, called Jacobi coefficients, and these, these are sort of the, the, the main object uh, that we are interested in. Um, I will switch a little bit this recurrence relation because uh, I need to actually monic orthogonal polynomials. So if you divide by the leading term, you obtain monic orthogonal polynomials and the corresponding three-term recurrence relation takes this form. So it's, it's, it's basically the same, except now instead of this an, um, this an disappears and now you have an squared. So sort of I, I will work with these coefficients, bn's and an squared in this form, because this is how they enter in the multiple case. So um, the typical example uh, that I want to, 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 for you to have in mind is the, the Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind, which corresponds to constant coefficients. So if you, if you take a orthogonality measure to be this semicircle distribution, as, as, as it is known, um, on, on say interval minus one, one, that corresponds to Jacobi coefficients being constant, one half everywhere and zero everywhere. And the corresponding uh, polynomials are called uh, Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind up to some multiplicative normalization. Now, of course, you can stretch the situation and, and shift it uh, around a little bit. So um, and in that case, you can, you can start with any semicircle distribution on any interval. That corresponds to, again, constant coefficients, ANs and BNs. And of course, the polynomials are going to be just rescaled and shifted and renormalized Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind again. <clears throat> so, okay, so, uh, so that's the, the basics of the orthogonal polynomials. Now, um, right, uh, so what I want now to discuss is here we are working with the constant coefficients. Now let's, let's make a compact perturbation of this. So uh, I, will, I will give it a name, and this is, this is typically called Nevi class. So uh, a measure is called in the Nevi class if the coefficients have limits. They're not constant anymore, but they have limits. So on the level of Jacobi operators, this is compact perturbation. So by using Weil theorem for those um, compact perturbations, you, you get that any measure in the Nevi class must satisfy that the essential support is equal to the same interval as before. Um, now, in the converse direction, there is a famous Deniso Rahmano theorem uh, that requires a little bit extra. So it requires not only essential support to be the interval, but also the uh, absolutely continuous part to be, um, to be uh, supported on the same interval. If this happens, then um, Deniso Rahmano theorem says that mu is in the Nevi class. 
So that's just a little bit of for you to, to, to get an intuition. I will try to, to, to discuss this in my class in the multiple case. Now, this is a multiple orthogonal polynomial situation. I will only discuss the, the case of two probability measures just, just because the, the formulas will be a little bit simpler, a bit more pleasant to look at. <clears throat> so um, we start with two measures, mu one and mu two on the real line. Uh, and we're looking for a monic polynomial of smallest degree satisfying these uh, two families of conditions. So you have some orthogonality, M orthogonality condition with respect to mu one and N orthogonality conditions with respect to mu two. So total M plus N orthogonality conditions, the minimal degree polynomial satisfying this is called multiple orthogonal polynomials of type two. Um, now, typically you would expect that the, the polynomial has degree M plus N just because we have M plus N orthogonality condition. And if indeed, if this is holds for every multi-index MN, then we say that mu one and mu two is a perfect system. So from now on, I will assume that we have a perfect system. So all the polynomials PMN has have sort of the right, the right degree. Uh, so typical example is Angelesco systems. If you have two measures that have uh, support intervals that are disjoint, um, then, then we say that this is Angelesco system and any Angelesco system is perfect. Now, um, now I want to discuss the, the, the analog of three-term recurrence relation. And this was discovered by Walter uh, in 2011. Um, so um, the, the, the analog of three term becomes in this form. Now we have four term recurrence uh, for, the, for, the, for the situation with two measures, it's four term. Now we have four, family of, uh, four families of coefficients now. You have sort of the B coefficients here, but you have the B coefficients here. That depends if you want to increase the first index. Here M, you increase to M plus one. Then you have one family of, of B indices. If you want to instead increase N to N plus one, then you have another family of, of, of B indices here. And you also have two families of A indices. This, this corresponds to A squared uh, in our previous notation. But anyway, we have four families of indices. They all depend on, on, on M and N. So they are sort of, they live on, on uh, Z2 lattice, on the positive Z2 lattice. And notice that this generalizes the usual Jacobi coefficients. If you put one of them to zero, so if you put n equal to zero, then the, the, um, the square root of a's and b's are the usual Jacobi coefficients. And if you put the other to zero, then a2 and b2 are the, the usual Jacobi coefficients. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so and so these are the coefficients that I want to work with. Uh, these are the coefficients that I want to, to study the limit. Now, notice that if you fix mu1 and mu2, that fixes these coefficients. So if you know mu1, then you know these coefficients. If you know mu2, you know these coefficients. Um, <clears throat> and that should uniquely determine everything else, all the, all the other coefficients as well. Um, just because, right, if you, if you have mu1 and mu2, all the coefficients should be uniquely determined. So that means that these coefficients on, on, the, on the boundary, on the margins, should determine all the coefficients inside as well. And uh, indeed, this is the case. And uh, this can be done by using the so-called compatibility conditions, which was also in the same paper uh, by uh, Walter. So uh, it turns out that there is these kind of compatibility conditions that, that these Bs and A satisfy. So sort of it's neighboring coefficients have some dependencies. <clears throat> and using these dependencies, by the way, you can compute all these coefficients just recursively. So as you can see, these are kind of uh, difference equations. And the main idea of this talk is that if you take a limit, this different, each of these difference equations become differential equation for the limit. <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna, uh, that, that's what we want to, to achieve here. Now to give you some uh, intuition, let me show you some, some coefficients. So again, we have four family of coefficients, A1, A2, B1, B2, and each of them are live on, on the Z2 lattice. So I just chose A1 coefficients. For the specific case when mu1 uh, is a semicircle on, on one interval, mu2 is on a semicircle on another interval and they're touching. So I have two intervals, they are touching to each other and mu1 is a semicircle here, mu2 is a semicircle here. Of course, renormalize. Now, a coefficients on this margin, on this edge, 
these are just the usual um, Jacobi coefficients for the, uh, let me see, for, for, for this measure, for mu1. Uh, so they are constant one because this is a semicircle, so Chebyshev uh, of the second kind, all the constant. These zeros are also automatic. That's just uh, some kind of um, a marginal condition uh, for, for this situation. Th these zeros basically ensure that on this edge, I'm, I'm having three term recurrence relation rather than four term recurrence relation. And everything else can be determined by using these compatibility conditions uh, before. And it, as you can see, when you start increasing n, so uh, sort of this, this direction is m, this increase this direction we have n. Uh, so when m or n go to infinity, you kind of see that the picture kind of stabilizes, right? So um, so what, what you can expect from this picture is that if you start taking various limits along any ray from the origin, then it looks like in every direction there is a, there is a limit, okay? So uh, in particular, this limit would correspond to the so-called diagonal um, uh, asymptotics, and that's what we, we, we were listening to on the previous talk, right? <clears throat> but I want to study not just diagonal, I want to study uh, every every direction. As you can see, it looks like, at least for this special case of semicircles, uh, it looks like the, the, the limit exists in every direction. Um, so this is for the case, for the case when you have two semicircles that, that uh, sorry, two semicircle law that are touching, so two intervals, two Angelesco system with two intervals that are touching. Um, uh, now this is a situation when you have um, when you have two semicircles that are not touching. So uh, now I have I, I moved basically one of them uh, a little bit a little bit away. So there is a small gap. Just want to just want to show you that uh, the picture slightly uh, there is some qualitative change that you can kind of notice. You can see that there is some kind of region here which kind of looks a little bit more constant. So. In this, you can see that 1.05. I mean, of course, it's it's all rounded up. Uh, it's all rounded numbers, uh, just for presentation. But you can see that uh, there is a bigger region where where the coefficients kind of don't seem to change much, and we will see this this phenomenon later um, uh, on on the when I do a little bit more uh, numerics. <clears throat> All right, so uh, basically the, the, the idea is now we have these A coefficients. I want to study the, the, the limit along these uh, various directions. So uh, formally, how do we do this? So we have A ns and B ns. Uh, we choose a sequence of M indices and N indices going to infinity in such a way that, that, um, that this quantity converges to a T. So T is sort of the direction. It goes from zero to one. So you can think, you can think about this direction as, uh, Oh, let's see, m is equal to zero, yes. So this is t equals zero. This direction corresponds to t equals one. The diagonal direction corresponds to a half and so on. And t, t varies from zero to one depending on this direction. So basically t is the angle divided by power of two. <clears throat> so uh, we will denote this to, to, to denote this limit, okay? And so we, we say that mu one, mu two is a, perf uh, is a belongs to the multiple Nevi class, if the limit of each coefficients A's and B's, and there are two of them, uh, A1, A2, B1, B2, along every ray, uh, the limit exists. And I will denote AJ to be the limit uh, of A coefficients, BJ the limit of the B coefficients. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a paper uh, by Aptekov Denisov Yatsalev, fairly recent, uh, that establishes the existence of this of these limits uh, for the for the case when you have um, absolutely continuous measures with analytic and non non vanishing weights. They have to be non vanishing in some neighborhood of the of the interval. And they show that the 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 system belongs to the multiple Nevi class, and they also give an, a way of computing the coefficients using uh, certain algebraic um, uh, functions on on the Riemann surfaces. <clears throat> Now it is conjectured that this result can be extended to to cover a more general situation when you don't have um, analytic weights, uh, but the idea is hopefully the the uh, this condition should be enough, just like in the usual Denisov Rachmanov theorem. But this is just a conjecture. This is this is not as, as far as I know this is not uh, proven yet. So, uh, but the point is there is a large class of measures that belongs to this multiple Nevi class. 
And a lot of papers just assume this as a condition, as a starting condition. A lot of papers just assume that, uh, that these limits exist. So we want to study these limits. Uh, by the way, uh, there is also a application in, in random matrices. Um, uh, this is a joint paper with, with Maurice Duitz and Benjamin Foss, uh, where we study the, the random matrices corresponding to this multiple orthogonal polynomials. And we show that the, um, that the eigenvalue statistics is asymptotically normal. And when we want to compute the, the, the asymptotic variance, this is the formula. This is sort of the, the usual strong Zegel form, um, formula. Um, but the, the, coefficient, the coefficients fk can be computed using this expression where a's and b's here are exactly the limits that I'm talking about. So this a1, a2, b1, b2 are exactly the limits along various rays uh, of this multiple of polynomials. polynomial. So it, it's a natural quantity that is that is required uh, in, in, in applications. Mm -hmm. So this is my uh, our main result um, for this for this situation. Um, so there are some three technical conditions that we, we kind of uh, assume. We assume that mu, mu1 and mu2 is, is in a multiple Noe class. We assume that the limit functions are piecewise continuously differentiable. And we also assume a, some kind of uniform convergence uh, of approximations to, to the functions. I, I will discuss this a little bit later. This is kind of a technical condition. Uh, we expect that this condition holds for a large class of, of, uh, of systems. Uh, but um, yeah, it is not clear. I mean, uh, I guess uh, if if you have a, a measures for which the, the original Jacobi coefficients uh, vary fast, then this will fail. But if the original Jacobi coefficients vary very smoothly, then it is expected that this condition should be should be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So if if you assume these three conditions, then we show that the limit functions a one, a two, b one, b two can be found by solving this differential equation. So we have four, four unknown, well, you can, you can in, instead of B1 and B2, you can take the difference, so then you have one less uh, functions. You have A1, A2, and B, and they satisfy the system of differential equations as follows. Now, in, in the special case of Angelesco system, when, when uh, you, can, you can reduce uh, this system of three equations with three unknowns to a system of two equations with two unknowns, it becomes quite messy, as you can see. Uh, you also get a four, in it, four boundary conditions. The, the specific form of this, this equation is, is not important, so you don't need to, to worry about it. Uh, what, what, is, what is interesting here is that this is very, very fixed. There is no, there is no dependence on, um, uh, on any external parameters, right? The only, when you start varying the, the, the supports of the measure, the boundary conditions are the only thing that change. The differential equation is fixed. It, there is no parameter here at all. This is, this is very thick. This doesn't change when you vary uh, the supports. Uh, on, only the boundary conditions will change. So alpha one, beta one, uh, alpha two, beta two are the supports of the orthogonality measures. And you can use this. You can uh, use these differential equations to, to numerically simulate um, the the limits, which which is what I will do later to show you the, the um, what kind of equations you get. All right. Uh, so uh, you can generalize this to the case of of, of d measures. So if you have uh, multiple orthogonal polynomials with uh, d orthogonality measures, then you have two d functions a j and b j's. And you have you get a family of two d times d minus one differential equations. Uh, basically, every compatibility condition gives you a separate differential equations, and they take this form. So, as you can see, these are th these are the compatibility conditions in this case. Uh, each, each one of them generate the corresponding uh, differential equation in the limit. This guy gives you this. This gives this, and this gives this. <clears throat> so um, I have six minutes. Maybe I'll give you some rough idea of the proof. Um, <clears throat> so the starting point again is the compatibility conditions. So it relates uh, the B1, B2, A1, A2 uh, coefficients together. Let me focus on this on this equation since it's the simplest one as well and try to, to, to give you an idea how this generates a differential equation. <clears throat> oh, by the way, uh, I should mention 
that the differential equations uh, for the case of two measures are, are real differential equations. I mean, uh, the ordinary differential equations, but for the case of more than two measures, then this becomes part of differential equations. Right, so we start with these, uh, with these uh, compatibility condition. We take the limit, we try to see what kind of uh, differential equation comes out. <clears throat> the idea is the following. So uh, remember we had these coefficients. Um, so to study the limit uh, of these coefficients, basically I will take one of these diagonals um, and I will, I will read these coefficients off and I will put it equal, I mean, I will, I will cram it into a function, into approximating function between zero and one. So the value of this function at zero will be equal to this. The value of this function at one will be equal to, to this. And I will put it uh, spaced all these other entries here, I will put equally uh, separated between, between zero and one. So that will be my approximating function. Um, and then I will I will increase and further and further by 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 by, uh, by moving this uh, these diagonals further and further. So then then um, then I will have a family of approximating functions. I will call them AJs. Um, well, I will call them AJs if these are the A coefficients, and I will call them BJs if these are the B coefficients. Um, so the formula this is what happens. Um, so. We think about n as n plus n. This is sort of the, this, the, the number of the diagonals that I'm, that I'm moving on. I will put the function bj at the, at the multiples of one over n to be equal to my b coefficient. And I will extend it by linearity everywhere in between. So these bn's are piecewise linear functions that I'm expecting to approximate well my, my limits. And these are the, the coefficients, but the, these are the, um, the functions that were here. Um, I do the same with a coefficient and with b coefficients. So, and, and then I take this n plus n to infinity. So I move further and further away from the origin. Um, and intuitively what you should think about this as, well, m over, over capital N is exactly going to converge to my variable t, my continuous variable t. One over n will become my delta t, sort of the differential of t. n over n will become one minus t, bj will, will become my function bj at, at, at the value of t. Um, but we also need these kind of coefficients as well, right? If you look at the compatibility condition, this will become b1 of t, this will become b2 of t, but this is a little bit shifted. This is a, a, a b1, but in a little bit shifted point. So if you do this, you, you realize that this is approximately bj evaluated at a shifted point. You express this shifted point to be centered at the at the point that we want this this is the this is a t right so i need to sort of make a taylor a taylor expansion in the, in the discrete form uh, this becomes t this becomes delta t times t and this becomes something much smaller than that so i get b evaluated at a, at a little bit shifted point i use taylor approximation i get that uh, this approximately equals to b of t uh, plus derivative plus something lower order term and so if you just formally put this in, I mean, you, you do the same with, with the other b, b n plus one, you get some other expression. And then the compatibility conditions, you plug it in, <clears throat> you see, you plug in uh, into this, our expression, b1 cancels, b2 cancels here. Uh, as you take n to infinity, th this, this goes to zero. Well, if you divide by delta t, and so you end up with a differential equation like this. <clears throat> so that's a rough idea. Of course, you need to show the uniform convergence of, of each of these terms. Uh, and somehow um, that's where we need that uh, these approximating functions approximate uh, our limits well. And then the next step is to show that the derivatives are approximated well, and this is automatic. Uh, after some work, of course, and then uh, in the limit, you end up with these differential equations. All right, I have two minutes, so some, some pictures, and then we are done. <clears throat> so uh, this is the limits of these four functions, a1, a2, b1, b2, uh, for the case when you have two touching supports, minus two, zero, zero, one, for example. Uh, so you can see that you have a nice smooth curve. Uh, so this differential equation that we that we saw before, uh, they are satisfied on the whole interval zero one, and you can compute the, the solution either from the left point or from the right point. Remember, we had differential equations 
with boundary condition either at the at zero, but we also had boundary condition at one. And in this situation, you can either start from zero and generate the whole curve, or you can start from one and generate the whole curve. Now, if you if you support don't touch, then you have a, a slightly different situation when you can start from the left end point and that you will generate this purple curve. It will keep going to somewhere, but it will it will the, the, the blue the blue graph here is the honest limit of the coefficient. This is what I compute by, by simulation by computing the, the limit of the uh, of the coefficients. The purple curve is the solution to the differential equation, and the green curve is also the solution to the differential equation from the other side. Um, so the, the the idea here, the point is there is a there is a region here, this where we have sort of plateau, uh, where the coefficients stop changing, where the limits of the coefficient is a constant function. Um, so and you, as 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 you remember, I showed you some simulation where where you kind of saw it that if if the supports don't touch, then you should have some region where the coefficients actually stop changing, and that's that's the idea here. Uh, uh, there is a region where 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 you can, actually your solutions are constants, and there is a region where 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 this is a uh, the, where the solution of the differential equation matches with the with the coefficients. All right. Thank you for your attention. That's all I wanted to say. And these are the references if you want. Okay. Thank you. So, any questions, comments, Andre? Please, short one. Okay. Uh, okay, hi, Russ. Good to see you. Uh, question. So instead of separating the intervals, what if you make them slide so there is an overlapping? Can you see what is happening then with the differential equations? Yes. Uh, I simulated this situation. Uh, you can, you can, uh, there is a still region where differential equation is uh, there will be a region where, where I don't know what happens. So where they overlap, there will be a region, just like here, there is a region where it's constant. There will, there, there will be a region where I think the limit don't exist. And so there will be, a, the, the graph that, 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 that you get is kind of still this curve, then a bunch of garbage, excuse me, and then again, a nice curve. So I think in this garbage situation, uh, I don't have a limit, but there will be a small interval on the left and on the right where I still have a nice limit using the same differential equation. I have a question too. Can I ask it? Uh, uh, I think we lost contact a little bit with the Sochi. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I can ask the question anyway. Yes, I can hear you well. <laughs> you, you can hear me. So in, in this case, when the two intervals are uh, uh, disjoint, uh, yeah. so you have this plateau. Uh, so how do you find where the plateau starts and where it ends? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, if you can't, you cannot see it from the differential equation. At least I, I cannot. Uh, I couldn't figure a way of seeing this, 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 this these, these points where they break. Um, there is, a, you can compute those, those, those constants uh, from uh, from the algebraic approach of Abchekov, uh, Denisov, uh, and Yatsalev. Um, uh, but but you cannot see it on this level of differential equation. I think. I think. Okay. Thanks. I'm sorry, do you have some eigenvalues in gap of something? I'm not an expert. Uh, eigenvalues, so uh, we, we suppose, we're supposing the supports are just intervals and they're separated. So uh, in this example, I didn't, I didn't allow any eigenvalues for me one or for me two, but in principle, um, I think a couple of eigenvalues outside should not, should not hurt the picture. 